businessman, investor, broker, author, financial commentator. He's the CEO and Chief Global Strategist of Europe Pacific Capital, Inc., a broker-dealer based in Westport, Connecticut. And I'm not going to go over his whole bio. He's well-known on the financial shows, made a lot of uh, accurate predictions, raised billions of dollars at his fund, Europac.net. Uh, he is a strong supporter of the Austrian School of Economic Thought, first introduced to him by his father that has been fighting this whole tyranny for about 45 years, I should add that. And he joins us for the balance of the hour. There is so much to get into. I want to ask him what he thinks is front and center. But first off, mainstream media is saying global collapse by the end of the year, next year. Much of the world's already collapsed if you're in the third world. I mean, it's just unprecedented. Middle East, Africa, Latin America. It goes from depression to recession. Just pick your poison. Uh, Japan never came out of their recession. But some will point at our economy and go, oh, it's great. Yeah, 0.2% growth rates earlier in the year. And that's with cooked numbers. So remember, we've got a lot of cooked numbers. I want things to be good. I don't want the bubble to pop, but we are on the biggest bubble in history. And then now we've got headlines like this. Top CEO warns of global reset. It's in the cards for sure. It could happen this year. Bloomberg is reporting on Texas wanting its billion in gold back from the private Federal Reserve. Germany's asked for its gold back. That's Bloomberg. They won't give it back. The Chinese. Then the Guardian reports that a lot of billionaires, including top insiders, are fleeing Israel, fleeing the U.S., fleeing, and going to New Zealand. A lot of Hollywood folks are going there. I told you that first five years ago. Is this just hysteria and they've jumped the gun? Or can this bubble go on forever? Uh, Ron Paul came out. We played the clip Friday. It made headlines all over the world from the Financial Times of London to RT to CNBC. Ron Paul, quote, economy will soon have a day of reckoning when you'll see the very, very big crash. I think we've got the congressman coming up later in the week or next week. That's being lined up right now, our former congressman. So that's setting the table here that I'm not saying there's going to be a collapse. I hope there isn't one. But I've never seen so many mainline people saying it with now AP reporting the Secretary of Defense is sending commandos to basically fight the Russians. Let's not pick a side in this. This is crazy, though. I mean, we're in their backyard. Uh, it, it, it's, it's just wild. Our government backing the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda light all over the Middle East. I, I mean, I've been doing this 20 years, and I thought I had seen it all. This is the craziest government's ever acted. Peter Schiff, am I overstating it, understating it? I mean, as an expert, as a smart guy, you know, proving himself in the real world, what are you doing for yourself? I mean, how would you boil it down? Where are we? Well, first of all, Alex, it's not about wanting the bubble to pop because all bubbles inevitably pop. The problem is the bigger they get before they do pop, the worse it is. So we should want the bubble to pop now. It should have popped years ago. Had it popped years ago, we would have been able to solve our problems instead of making them worse. Uh, so unfortunately, we have delayed the day of reckoning, and there's a lot more to reckon with. And you know what Congressman Ron Paul was talking about, and of course, I've been a fan of his for a long time, it's nothing new. I mean, this collapse has been a long time in the making. It's just that we're now closer to it because of all the things that we've done to delay that day of reckoning, but that have simply worsened the very problems that make that day of reckoning necessary. Sure. What do you say to people? Because I've seen this said about you, said about me, everybody. You, you're going to create bad confidence and make it pop as if we're <laughs> the ones that did this. No, it's, it's not all about confidence. If we just believe in something that's phony, uh, that it's just going to sustain itself. I mean, that is the problem. Too many people believe all this nonsense, which is one of the reasons that it's gotten so out of control. But as a result, all the problems have been exacerbated. And the fact that we've been able to borrow all this money from around the world and spend it just means that we've got a bigger problem. Just like, look, look, there's Greece is in the news today because they're trying to solidify a bailout. But the reason the Greeks got themselves into such a big problem is because for years they kept borrowing money at artificially low interest rates. Well, we've made the same problem. It's just that our creditors haven't figured it out yet. And so they're still willing to loan us money, even though we can't pay any of it back. Well, they're clearly scared that if they don't prop us up, it'll bring everything down. But that only adds to Washington's hubris and bizarre, bizarre arrogance. 
Well, yeah, and, and of course, the longer it takes, the more false confidence it builds. And, you know, a lot of people have begun to criticize me over the last few years, saying, oh, Peter Schiff, and of course, not just me, but other people have been predicting this gloom and doom. And you see, nothing bad has happened, and so they're wrong. But meanwhile, a lot of bad stuff has happened. We have this phony recovery. The real economy is weakening uh, despite all of the doctored up statistics. The average man in the street is worse off. His network is going down. He's got a, a lower paying job. He's got no savings. He's loaded up with debt. This thing is a ticking time bomb. The, the fact that the fuse is a little bit longer than some of us might have guessed doesn't under you know under, undercut the reality. It just means with all the new banking manipulations and insider trading and derivatives and all the rest of it they've been able to prop it up longer but every analyst out there pretty much says that when it finally goes under unless you're talking about krugman or something that it's going to be spectacular what does it signify then that so many mainline analysts and people and even folks that pushed all this Kinsey and economics garbage are now saying we're in deep trouble, wealth inequities and all the rest of it. It seems like they're trying to have their cake and eat it, too. That signifies to me that we are getting close to the bubble popping. Well, the fact that so many people refuse to acknowledge that there's a bubble in the first place is more is a good contrarian indicator. But you've got to remember that they never see the bubbles. Right. The Federal Reserve certainly never sees them. They're always in denial even after they pop. You know, go back to the, the Great Recession, the 2008 financial crisis. Nobody at the Fed saw that coming. In fact, by mid-2008, they still had no recession anywhere in their forecast, despite the fact that we were seven months in to the greatest recession since the Great Depression. Uh, they were clueless. Even we talked about, you know, the, you mentioned earlier the negative GDP in the first quarter. Well, halfway through the first quarter, the Fed was still predicting growth of near 3%. So they have no idea what's going to happen. And even if they do, the last thing they're going to do is admit it. If they see problems on the horizon, they're going to deny it. They're going to pretend everything is great because they do believe it's a confidence game. And the last thing they want to do is pierce that confidence bubble. What do you make of all the bizarre geopolitical actions that are going on? Is that an attempt to shore up the dollar, A, and then B, uh, for lay folks out there, what is the bubble or bubbles, and what type of uh, event do you think could precipitate that? Why are they saying so many analysts now the end of this year is a prime zone for a bubble pop? Well, I didn't even know that many analysts were saying that. I think that's still probably a small minority of opinion. Most of the analysts are still cheerleading this phony recovery. They're convinced that it's real. But you know, when you put your finger on the dollar, that's been a big key to this. Uh, the dollar has had a very you know, significant rise over the last couple of years, although it hasn't been rising since March. It kind of peaked out in March. But the basis of the dollar rally was the false confidence in the U.S. economy and the generally held view that the Fed was now going to start raising interest rates and shrinking down its balance sheet because it had fixed all the problems. Well, the reality is it didn't fix the problems. It made them all worse. And so now it can't shrink its balance sheet. It can't raise interest rates without precipitating a worse financial crisis than 2008. The markets haven't come to terms with this reality yet. But eventually they will figure out that this is all talk, that the Fed can't raise rates because we're too addicted to cheap money. We're going to have to have another injection of QE4 to keep the bubble from deflating. And when that happens, the bottom will drop out of the dollar. And that's what's going to usher in the real crash that I wrote about, it's a, you know, the, the, the title of my most recent book, you know, The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy, How to Save your, Yourself and Your Country, is all about the economic collapse that happens when the bottom drops out of the dollar when re because reality finally sets in. I want to spend a lot of the time today on your book and, and, and tell folks if they want to really get prepared where to get it. Uh, I mean, I just feel so bad because, I mean, historically, there's no way this will go on forever. As you said, the longer it goes on, the worse it's going to get. The real crash, how to save yourself and your country, Peter D. Schiff, uh, New York Times bestselling author, on with us right now. Before we go to break, though, surely uh, you've seen the articles. You manage a lot of rich people's money. Uh, London Guardian, you name it, admits what we already knew with a lot of rich people are getting armored redoubts in the Ozarks or in uh, Montana or in uh, New Zealand, uh, or they're building safe houses. 
They're acting really yeah. paranoid. They're pulling cash out. They're pulling gold out while criticizing gold. What do you make of that uh, fear under the surface, or is it not that bad? Well, look, I think there's a lot of reasons to be concerned. I mean, some people might be more concerned than others to the extent that they have these types of plans. But, you know, some people might think that's radical. But I think what's even more radical is thinking everything is great and doing nothing to protect yourself. You know, the vast majority of wealthy people aren't going to be wealthy in a few years. They're going to be wiped out. I mean, they may have all of their dollars. You might still have millions of dollars in treasuries and, you know, in CDs or in your annuities or wherever. It's you like got having a trunk full of Confederacy notes at the end of the Civil War. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be the same thing or like having a wheelbarrow full of rice marks or a bunch of Zimbabwe dollars. I mean, people have to understand that the history of fiat currency is not good. And people that don't perceive and act upon these threats, you know, end up with severe losses. And, you know, the U.S. government has borrowed way beyond its capacity to repay. The only avenue politically expedient is inflation. And it is going to happen. And I think we're on the doorstep of a currency crisis that will wipe out the wealth of the vast majority of Americans who are foolish enough to store their wealth in U.S. currency. So what I'm helping my clients to do, the wealthy and not so wealthy, is to get their financial assets out of harm's way. All right, let's talk about that when we come back. I'm country. gonna. We got to go to break. Peter Schiff's our guest. I want you to come back and walk through some of the basics. Obviously, folks can read about it in the book or check out your uh, site. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show. I'm your host, Alex Jones. Peter Schiff of Europac.net is our guest, best-selling author, um, fund manager. Made a lot of accurate predictions. Um, predicted a few years ago that we'd see a larger collapse in the West than we've seen so far. But uh, that's what a lot of other people said. I mean, we've never seen a bubble that I've studied in history get this big. Uh, that's across the board in bonds and in the currencies and just, just, just everywhere. It is, it is la la land because when the music stops, it's going to be spectacular. So I want to ask you in the next segment what he thinks different scenarios are collapses could look like not predictions but you know what they could look like how we can protect ourselves individually we're gonna talk about that right now uh, in his book but at the same time i've just got so many questions because i wish there was some way to stop the bubble i mean he makes the point that it needs to go ahead and just pop i wish there was a way to just freeze it and then slowly deflate it he was saying earlier it needed to pop a long time ago. That's what Ron Paul and others are saying as well. How would we have gotten out of this if we would have popped it three, four, five years ago? And how would have that been better versus now? Well, you know, the last good opportunity to pop it was uh, in the aftermath of the bursting of the uh, real estate bubble and during the financial crisis of 08, 09. Uh, unfortunately, there was more pain that needed to be had at that time. And a lot of people who speculated should have lost a lot of money. There should have been a lot of financial institutions that should have been allowed to fail. And a lot of people should have lost a lot more money than they did. Instead, you know, the middle class suffered and a lot of the wealthy people who gambled so badly with cheap money from the government were rewarded. Uh, for all their risk taking. And now they're taking even more risk. But, you know, you can't just slowly deflate a bubble. Right. It, it, you you, you, you got to let it pop. That is the problem, because the, the bubble, the activities that comprise the bubble are preventing legitimate economic activity from taking place. So as the Fed uh, directs resources or misdirects re resources to sustaining bubbles, the resources that are necessary for legitimate economic growth, wealth creation, good paying jobs, those resources are no longer available. So the quicker the bubble pops, the better. The problem is the political uh, you know, uh, carnage here uh, is too much for anybody to want to own up to. So instead, we kick the can uh, down the road. But, you know, we're rapidly running out of road and, and, and that can is, you know, getting bigger and bigger. Certainly well said. And I mean, obviously, it needs to pop. It should have popped. Folks don't want the political pain. But when it does collapse, what do you expect it to look like? I mean, a lot of the public really are spoiled brats. And it's so wrong to take taxpayer money and our children's future to bail out uh, billionaires and yuppies and people. I mean, that really is obscene. And and will will they get away with another banker bailout next time that's three, four times bigger? I mean, maybe they've set up a scenario where everything has to be sacrificed to this black hole. 
Well, I think the one thing that will be sacrificed is the value of the dollar. And of course, everybody will suffer who is not prepared. But I think the government is already all in on this bad monetary policy. They are going to you know, keep this monetary pedal to the metal at all costs. So they're going to keep interest rates at zero or practically zero. They're going to do QE4. They're going to do QE5. They're going to do everything they can to stop the real estate bubble from deflating, to stop the stock bubble from deflating, to stop the bond bubble from deflating, to keep this whole house of cards propped up as long as possible. And what they have to do is sacrifice the dollar in order to sustain everything else. But ultimately, when the dollar goes, everything goes, because it doesn't matter if you still have your money in the bond market, if the money isn't worth anything, right? So once the dollar collapses, because they have to print so many of them to keep all the other bubbles from bursting, then the dollar bubble is ultimately the one that goes, and that does the most damage, because what it's gonna do is dramatically increase the cost of living. I mean, the Federal Reserve is pretending there's no inflation right now, but the average American knows how much his cost of living is going up. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Wait till the cost of living doubles, triples, quintuples or more as a result of a plunging dollar. Americans are going to see their standard of living permanently reduced in a very dramatic way. And I would expect massive crime waves. Well, probably we already have, you know, a lot of crime, but it's going to get a lot worse, especially when people start blaming somebody. You know, we've created a society of entitlement where people just expect that they've got something coming to them and where they don't get it. You know, when all these government benefits are no longer valuable because they don't buy anything, because there's nothing available to buy with dollars. Yes, a lot of people are going to be frustrated and they're going to take those frustrations to the streets. Massive civil unrest, which the government, not just here, but around the world, are gearing up for. And I know, Peter, you like to say it's incompetence, but at a certain level, it's a mix of incompetence and organized uh, thought here. Because, I mean, the Pentagon admits they're preparing for civil unrest and collapse. So do the British intel. I want to ask you about that when we come back and get into your book, what you recommend people do to protect themselves. Stay with us. Power Reviews Express is one of the biggest third-party review sites like Yelp or any of those. And we have it embedded at Infowars.com, Infowarsstore.com on all of our products so you can review them. And we've even been contacted by the folks over there saying we've never seen someone with a 99 across the board. And I think that shows our listeners love us. We're talking about tens of thousands of reviews. Some of the products have thousands apiece, hundreds of products at Infowarsstore.com. It's how we fund our operation. But in the nutraceutical area, it's a 5.0. And we've had this for about six months, and the crew kept saying, why don't you point out the reviews at InfoWarsStore.com or InfoWarsLife.com? Look at just a few of the X2 reviews. This is from Portland, Oregon, Sue. Detoxing, so I know it's working. Want to buy some for everyone I love. Waking up, not hungry, and alert. Looking forward to what's coming next. Could feel the toxins being pulled out of my hands. No ibuprofen in a week. Blood pressure down. In a good mood. If you care about your health, order some today. These are third-party reviews, folks. We don't make medical claims as a nutraceutical. It is pure, earth-sourced iodine. Not the stuff out of the ocean. Not the stuff mixed with a bunch of other crap. Not the stuff that tastes horrible and eats holes in your stomach. Your thyroid is full of bad halogens, fluoride, bromine, all this other crap. Why do they say seafood's good for you? It's got some iodine in it. <clears throat> and we're selling out of it. We've had it out for a few years. People just absolutely love it. That's just one of the reviews. Here's one more. We'll go back to our guest. This is from uh, Gaming Org, New Mexico, USA. This product is everything said about it. Warning, if you have high libido, you might want to think twice for trying it. It's that powerful. And then it just goes on. Here are these reviews. I don't want to write a lengthy review, but I will say that the product is bleeping hardcore. I lift every day and the stuff has boosted me to a maximum energy. You have to try it. It's not just, and not just listen to reviews, it's awesome. Infowarslife.com. And here's the deal. Talk to your physician beforehand, because if your thyroid's full of a bunch of other bad stuff, I mean, I detoxed two weeks into it for about a week. It felt terrible. And then I had so much more energy. Infowarslife.com. And it'd be like if you didn't have vitamin C, you'd have holes in your arms and your teeth would fall out. And if you took it, you know, it's, it's amazing. But when you first have scurvy, you take a bunch of vitamin C, you can get sick at first. 
Uh, I mean, it's, 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 it's not rocket science. Most people are deficient in iodine. It's hard to get pure sources of it. Infowarslife.com or 888-253-3139. And your purchase of the books, the films, the T-shirts, the high-quality non-GMO heirloom seeds, all of it funds this media operation. We're self-funded, unlike MSNBC that gets banker bailout stimulus money or NPR that gets taxpayer money or the big banks that get bailout money to give the media money. We are funded by folks that believe in what we're doing and support the First Amendment, so thank you so much. Europac.net, I'm going to try to shut up and give Peter Schiff for about 15 minutes of this segment that's left. It's a long segment, the floor, to really get into what he thinks is most important, to talk about how he's protecting himself, what he's telling his clients. You can also go to Euro Pacific if you'd like to be one of his clients. Uh, I want to give him the floor so it's not just me here, a layman, asking the questions. We're going to go to him in a second. But first, since I mentioned it, as I noticed on Infowars.com, a comment on one of the articles going, I just heard Jones say that Ron Paul says the stock market's going to be in trouble soon. You know, I didn't hear that. So we'll just play the clip from last Thursday on Ron Paul's own TV show where he said it. It's all over the news. And just because people are ignorant and don't know about it doesn't mean we're lying. Here's what Ron Paul had to say. It could be tomorrow, it could be a month, it could be a couple years from now, uh, because it all depends on a psychological acceptance of the system. So a lot of people who are still making a lot of money know the system is not going to last, but they figure, well, if everybody else thinks it's going to last, they just keep owning bonds and, and buying stocks. Today they're buying stocks, and, and yet next week they may sell them all again. So, uh, no, I don't think there's any way to know what the time is, but you know, after 35 years of a gigantic bull market in bonds, believe me, they cannot reverse history and you cannot print money forever and deceive the markets forever. Eventually, the markets will rule and that's only a question of when that will happen. And of course, uh, I run a little bit scared because I think there will be a day of reckoning. Uh, let's get uh, your comment on that and then I want you to cover the angles you think are most important, Peter Schiff. Well, of course, you know, Ron Paul has been giving these warnings for a long time, as have I. You know, you remember Ron Paul was warning about the problems that Fannie and Freddie, you know, as early publicly as 2002. Of course, it took until 2008 for those warnings to come to fruition. But, you know, whenever you understand a problem, you always understand it early. And that allows your critics uh, to claim that you're wrong because the problem gets bigger while you're warning about it. But of course, then when it blows up, they claim that nobody could have predicted this and they call the people who did, well, they're stop clocks. You know, they've been saying it for so long and so who cares? Uh, but the only stop clocks are the people who constantly try to tell us that everything is fine and that the government has solved our problems and that the Federal Reserve is doing the right thing. Uh, so Ron Paul is right. I think the problem is even bigger than he's publicly letting on. I think, you know, he's afraid to really say just how bad it really is, but it is pretty bad. And yes, we don't know exactly when it's going to happen. And, you know, one thing I want to point out, you mentioned before the break that you thought that this is kind of being done deliberately by our leaders, like they're set out to wreck the country. You know, our leaders are so incompetent, I don't think they can do this by design. If they actually wanted to wreck the country, we'd probably be in good shape because they would achieve the opposite. So I think it's a, it's a case, you know, it's a case of, 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 of bad intentions. You know, they think they're doing the right thing and then they get committed and, and, and they're committed to a strategy and they get deeper and deeper and deeper into it because they never want to acknowledge that they were wrong. So rather than admitting the mistakes, they keep on, you know, doubling down on the same losing strategy. And ultimately, it is going to blow up. And your listeners need to do something. They need to take action because we don't know when this day of reckoning is going to come. It could come next week. It could come next year. But, you know, you, you can either prepare too early or too late. And too late isn't going to work. So you got to be too early. There's so many questions I could ask, but I'd like to get into what you think is front and center, what you'd like to impart to the audience. I mean, obviously, I could ask the question of if they're not trying to wreck things uh, intentionally, uh, they certainly profit off the crises, though, every time because they always get bailed out. Oh, yeah. Look, they never want to let a crisis go to waste. And you know, I always remember, you know, what Harry Brown used to say about, you know, the government is great at breaking your leg. 
and then handing you a crutch and saying, you see, without me, you couldn't walk. Uh, so, yes, the government always benefits from the poverty they cause because now the impoverished look to government for a solution. And so, yes, I mean, it's a self-perpetuating uh, spiral uh, where the government benefits from its own mistakes. But people have to wake up to the reality that it is the government that broke their leg. And without the government, they would have two good legs and they wouldn't need this ridiculous government crutch. And they'd be hobbling around on it and thanking the government for this crutch <laughs> when instead of, you know, they could thank the free market for having two healthy, strong legs that, you know, where they wouldn't need any kind of any kind of crutch. But that's not going to happen, right? We're going to have this crisis. There's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing your listeners can do about it. We can't stop it, but we can certainly prepare for it ourselves and limit the damage to ourselves so that we're in a position to help clean up the mess. When could we have stopped solutions. it? When could we have stopped it? We, you and me, never. They're not going to take us seriously. We're going to be relegated to the fringes. Sure, but I meant the but, system. I mean, if they weren't insane, when when could they have? Uh, currently, what would smart economic policy be from your perspective? No one can deny free markets. Only problem is it creates so much wealth, our kids become spoiled brats. I mean, communism is a joke. Socialism is a disaster. Free market creates just uh, over-the-top wealth, prosperity choices. And so that's why every spoiled, rotten, you know, college kid who hadn't worked in three generations bad mouths it because they're idiots. But, you know, so many spoiled, rotten kids are part of the communist brigades now, literally here in Austin, marching around with red flags. It's hilarious if it wasn't so scary. Uh, I mean, I'm kind of ranting here. It's just free market works so good. Why aren't we doing it? And meanwhile, the free market's getting blamed <laughs> for people that aren't yeah. following it. Yeah. You know, it's not popular with the voters. That's the problem. Politicians promising freedom don't get elected. They want to promise something for nothing. But the good news is capitalism works so well that as soon as we try it, right, we can really solve these problems very quickly. I mean, look how some of these countries like Japan or, or West Germany, look at how quickly they rose from the asses of the Second World War. I mean, their countries were bombed, you know, back to the Stone Age. Nothing you know, was standing. We're, we're, yeah, so we're, we are not in a situation anywhere near that bad. All we need is the freedom to, to pull ourselves out of this government-created, you know, gigantic hole. But, you know, we still dig it deeper because politically that's the easiest thing to do. But when could we have stopped it? Look, we could have stopped it any time there was the political will to stop it. But unfortunately, there's been people around the world willing to loan us more money so that we don't have to do it. It's like, when is a drug addict, you know, finally go to rehab? Normally, he has to hit rock bottom before he does that. His wife has to leave him. He's got to lose his job. You know, he wakes up, in, you know, in his street somewhere. He has no memories. He's in a pile of his own vomit and urine. And then maybe finally, when he's lost it all, he finally goes into rehab and maybe gets his life turned around. We're probably going to have to reach that, that, that point as a nation. That's the point. But individually, we don't have to do that, right? We could get rid of our dollars now. There are countries around the world. People could invest in places like Switzerland and Singapore and New Zealand and Hong Kong and other countries around the world. They're not nearly as screwed up as we are. Uh, their currencies are in better shape. Their economies are in better shape. They have more economic freedom than we do. You can buy gold. You can buy silver. You can own assets around the world. So you don't have to go down with this, with this ship. And so you're in a lifeboat yourselves, and you can help other people out of the water so that they don't drown. I know you don't give like individual advice over the air. It's impossible. But let's say a you know, hypothetical person out there, whatever hypothetical scenario you come up with, what would you be doing right now to protect your assets? Where do you think the best investments are? Uh, what do you think is going to be in trouble during this implosion? What's going to be doing good during the implosion? Yeah, well, I think all dollar denominated assets, particularly debt instruments, are going to lose the most in terms of real purchasing power. And what I would invite your listeners to do is individually talk to our representatives at Euro Pacific Capital, Europac.com. You know, we tailor portfolios uh, for people. You know, our minimums for my mutual funds are as low as twenty five hundred dollars. And I have mutual funds that are designed specifically to protect you from the problems that I see coming. And then we have separately managed accounts where the minimums are 250000 and we have solutions you know, uh, for people in various amounts of money, 50000 100000 The important thing is to protect the purchasing power of what you work so hard to save. A lot of people are going to watch uh, the value of their savings evaporate. So many people are focused on preserving their principal. I don't want to lose any money. 
Well, that's not going to do you any good if your money loses value. So you've got to think outside the box and you've got to prepare for the real crisis that nobody is worried about, that nobody is predicting. People are thinking, oh, what if the stock market crashes? What if the real estate market crashes? Those were the last bubbles that burst. This one is much bigger. And even if those bubbles don't burst, because the Fed fills them with so much air by printing so much money, it's not going to matter when the dollar collapses. That is the biggest threat that people face, particularly if you're planning on retiring. You know, I think retirement in America is going to go the way of the single uh, family household. You know, once upon a time in America, if you were a guy and you had a job, your wife didn't need to work. Now most people's wives have to work and they can still barely uh, make ends meet. But at one time, Americans could actually stop working and enjoy their golden years. That's not going to happen anymore. I mean, you know, pretty soon if you if, if somebody sees somebody retired on an old sitcom, they're not even going to know what that is. It's like, hey, hey, why is that person not working? What are they doing? You know, why don't they have a job? You know, oh, oh that's called retirement. That used to happen in America. But, you know, nobody retires. People are going to have to work every day until they drop dead because they're not going to be able to have enough purchasing power. Uh, to buy the things that they need to sustain themselves in retirement. So those are the people who are most important. You know, you mentioned the young people. The young people can leave. They can pick up and move out of this country. Just like my grandparents came here looking for opportunity, our grandkids can leave in, in, in pursuit of the same thing. It's the people that can't leave that have already spent a lifetime working to build up a nest egg. You know, that nest egg can crack. It'll be rotten if you don't do something to protect it. <sighs> It's so sad, and of course, what's taken our money and devalued it is all this inflation, and it's all the regulations and bureaucracy you know, where people have to work so many jobs. Uh, it's clear big government regulations, uh, insider groups being exempt has caused this uneven playing field. I have two questions for you, Peter Schiff. Again, folks, Europac.net, who's joining us here, major fund manager. A... Why are the Texas government and other governments asking for their gold from the Federal Reserve? Why is the New York Fed saying we're not going to give it to you or we're going to give it to you a little bit a year over the next decade? What does that expose? Uh, why do we hear all these big banks calling for an end of cash, uh, calling for you know, bail-ins again in Europe with Greece? I want to talk about that, and then I want to ask the other question, which is, the argument that the fact that our bond market is so weak, the fact that the dollar is so weak, everybody's scared and is propping it up and will just keep propping it up because they don't want everything to come down. Yeah, well, 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 first of all, the dollar has been propped up recently. It's not as weak as it would be if people understood the predicament. It's because people have a false sense of confidence in the U.S. economy. And because they believe the Fed is actually going to embark on a rate hiking campaign, that's the reason for the dollar's strength, or at least relative strength. And that's what's been keeping this whole thing from collapsing. It's keeping people buying into our bond market. It's propping up our economy. It's making it possible for Americans to buy things even though we don't make them. We can run these huge trade deficits because our creditors are willing to hold our currency in instead of demanding payment and actual goods. Sure, but they're not, but they're, they're not trying to save us though. Every time it goes down, they run in and buy it. Well, well, they haven't had to recently because there's been yeah. a lot of fools. A lot of currency speculators have been buying. But, you know, currency speculators have been wrong in the past. They've overestimated the strength of the U.S. economy, and they've done it again. And I think the dollar is on the verge of a collapse. And again, that is going to be the real crisis as to why Texas or anybody else is demanding that the Federal Reserve return their gold. I think they're worried that the gold is not actually there. You know. This, we're getting closer and closer to a real crisis, and it's, it, people around the world want to actually have their gold. Because the problem is when there is a, a rush back to gold and out of fiat currencies, which may not just be the dollar, but the euro, the yen, there are a lot of currencies that have problems. But I think the dollar's problem dwarfs all the others, but the other problem, other you know, sure. currencies suffer from the same disease. But when there's a real rush back into gold, there's no gold. There's not nearly enough gold to go around. Let's talk not about that. <laughs> yeah. One final segment with Peter Schiff back in three minutes. I want to break down precious metals. It's come out. They've been artificially uh, depressing it, just like they've been rigging the currency markets and interest rates. I mean, that's now all admitted. Where is that going? And is the rush to get physical gold out of the Federal Reserve vaults a sign of a rush to the exits? We'll be talking to Jakari Jackson, our reporter, via video Skype, who's on the ground in Charleston, the site of the tragic events last Wednesday night at the church. 
they sent in the Democratic Party operatives to try to stir stuff up. And the mainly black uh, crowd um, of Christian folks just said, get out of here. We're, we're not going to have a race war like you want. So really exciting. We're going to get an update for about 10, 15 minutes with Yukari. Then all this other economic, military uh, news we haven't gotten to. Uh, Earth inner six extinction phase with many species, including our own, labeled the walking dead. That's a major new government report out by Stanford, Princeton, uh, and Berkeley. Is it fear-mongering or... Is there something really behind it? I'll give you my take. That's all coming up. I just want to be clear about something here. Again, I didn't build this system. You didn't build it. But we've all kind of collectively been part of it. And I don't put all this news out trying to scare people. It's like if I called my neighbor because their house was on fire. I'm not scaremongering. There's flames coming out. Historically, as Ron Paul said, as Peter Schiff said, this has always gone really disastrously. And now it's gotten bigger than ever. Uh, the establishment acts like it can go on forever while they hoard gold, hoard, hoard cash, buy farmland and build bunkers and try to act like they're nobody. Uh, so I don't see them in their actions uh, belying that they believe the confidence game they're pushing. In the five minutes we've got left, EuroPacific.net, his new book. Uh, well, it's been out for a while. It's a bestseller. Uh, the Real Crash, How to Save Yourself. Uh, your country, Peter D. Schiff. In closing, is this move to get the gold away from the Federal Reserve and these governments trying to hold more gold and UT buying gold and Texas wanting its gold back, is that a move towards the exits and uh, any other points you think are important to make? Well, you know, I think the movement started abroad. Remember, the Germans trying to get their gold, but there are a lot of other foreign central banks that are not nearly as big players as uh, the Bundesbank, but they've been trying to repatriate their gold uh, and get it out of the United States. So it shows that people are beginning to doubt. You know, they're beginning to question whether the emperor has any clothes. And so they're asking for their gold. And that's one of the reasons that I think individuals should ask for their gold, too. I mean, a lot of individuals, that's why we sell physical gold and recommend that people take delivery. Own your own gold, right? Do what these central banks are doing. Don't necessarily trust to have all your gold in the hands of a third party. I, and that includes U.S. banks. I wouldn't want to keep my gold in a safety deposit box because, you know, if they ever confiscate it, that's the first place they're going to look. So you're not going to get it out of your safety deposit box. Uh, so you need to do something to have physical ownership. But I, I like to spread it around the world. I have clients. We store gold in Australia. We store it in Switzerland. We store it in Singapore. I believe in diversifying where you have your gold. Have some of it, you know, with yourself, but have other the other gold outside the country. That's right. It's not about making money day. now. It's about keeping your money. Yeah, and if you have to leave the country one day, I mean, you might not be able to take anything with you. So it's going to be good to have that gold uh, safely offshore so that it'll be waiting for you when you get wherever it is you're going. And, you know, hey, by the way, I've got the website now, Europac.com. I finally bought that. So I'm not just Europac.net, but I'm, I'm Europac.com, too. Well, fantastic. <laughs> uh, you know, I tell you, Peter, it is an amazing time to be alive. And, and when all this unravels, which it will... It's like you said, they're going to say, who could have seen it coming? And then I've got all those clips of Ron Paul on the House floor seven, eight years before warning. Democrats at 15 years before warning. Uh, video you five, six years before warning on. I mean, it, it, it's just crazy how they play dumb. And this confidence game is just scary. Yeah, they never want to acknowledge the, re the critics. I remember, you know, in the days right after the financial crisis of 2008, when they convened hearings in Washington to figure out why there was a crisis. You know, I was begging to be called as a witness. I've since testified twice in Congress on other matters, but I wanted to testify on that committee because I knew why we had a financial crisis, but they refused to let me talk. Instead, all they did is talk to people who blamed greedy corporations You're right. and, and who recommended more government as the solution. Peter Schiff, amazing. Thank you. I'm Alex Jones. Stay with us.